सो थैंक यू थैंक यू वीर भाई थैंक यू राज थैंक यू पारस फॉर द इंट्रोडक्शन एंड फॉर द अपॉर्चुनिटी यू नो फॉर गिविंग अवर थॉट्स ऑन दिस वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक सर ऑलरेडी लेट डाउन द फाउंडेशन एंड द इंपॉर्टेंस ऑफ दिस टॉपिक सो हाउ वी आर स्ट्रक्चर इज वी रन थ्रू द प्रेजेंटेशन वेर वी हैव इनिशियल फ्यू स्लाइड अबाउट द बेसिक्स ऑफ कंटरप्राइजिंग and then look at it uh, how it is you know from an audit perspective we are making it more relevant uh, so he uh, requested to share the slide and you know you can start off i'll i'll first like to thank mihir i'll first like to thank paras for such a generous introduction uh, as mihir sir rightly covered transferring is a very evolving topic and in day to day structure several new developments come out uh, as we are in mid october this is the best time that Uh, we are going to learn about transfer pricing and discuss ab- about its practical aspects i have tried to keep the coverage of a lecture in most simplest manner so that even you can understand this topic very well and you can connect with how the transfer pricing ideology the ideology works it. on hearing the word transfer pricing audit many of you might might think that such a it is such an alien subject uh, which was even case for me 2 years back when i started transfer pricing however as you deep dive in the basics this topic would turn out to be an interesting as well as an insightful activity so with no further delays we'll move on with the topic uh, transfer pricing transfer pricing or transfer price usually refers to a price between a cross border transaction between associate enterprise to understand this with an example we'll start with an example of tuti inc and mr babu who are a related person so mr babu is a farmer who has a mango mango orchid and he sells orchid uh, he sells mangoes to fruity inc for production of fruit a uh, famous drink so for this fruity inc gives mr babu say suppose consideration of rupees 1000 for each box of mango now this price at which fruity inc and mr babu are dealing is called as transfer price a uh, further extending the example we have mr ramu also who is not related to mr Fru- uh, who is not related to fruity inc so mr ramu also has a orchid he also supplies mangoes and for supplying this mangoes mr ramu gets a consideration of 2000 per box now it is clearly identifiable that the consideration mr babu gets is is quite less than what mr ramu is earning in a glo- in a domestic sima- scenario this might not be concern as the profit still remains in india but as soon as we are in different countries when this is a cross border transaction which means fruity inc is in mauritius where taxes are relatively lesser than mr than both the individuals being in india where taxes are relatively higher now what happens in this case mr babu earns rupees 1000 instead of earning rupees 2000 which 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 leads to lesser profits earned by mr babu in india this results to lesser amount chargeable to charge to tax in india whereas profit getting shifted from india to mauritius uh and this is the concept of profit shifting wherein the global mncs structure their group in such a manner and set the transfer pricing policies in such a manner that profits are shifted slowly and gradually to jurisdiction where transfer price where taxation is usually very less compared to the jurisdiction where taxes are usually high so transfer pricing is based on this concept of profit shifting and erosion of tax base so transfer pricing regulation in india was introduced in the year 2001 with the sole intent of preventing this erosion of indian tax base with globalization and several liberal policies and mnc structure and several group transaction has become quite a normal these days and we can see it as frequently as uh, as frequently in our day to day transaction so it becomes very important to protect the indian tax base and to avoid the shifting of revenue from india with that intent chapter 10 was introduced in india which is which is titled as special provisions for anti avoidance of tax rules uh, tax a uh, tax rules so section 92 of the 92 being the uh, machinery provision says that 
any income which arises from an international transaction shall be shall be computed having regards to arms length price when i say this uh i will say that section 92 is not a charging section unlike our uh, sections of pgpp salary which charges the income on the assessee under the income tax act moreover section 92 is a machinery provision which takes that any transaction any international transaction that is happening has regards to arms length price so three important things that we the three important words that we need to understand from this is income international transaction and arms length price so transfer pricing is not along with being applicable to income is also applicable uh, when it comes to when it comes to expenses and cost allocation cost allocation transactions in the very sense when expenses are overpaid it gradually in indirectly reduces the income uh, income offered by tax to the assessee and hence that is to be also noted down uh, coming to the three important terms income as discussed income transfer pricing provisions cannot be any income directly uh, uh, cannot is not a charging provision that is it cannot bring any income chargeable to tax under that what transfer pricing actually intends to look at is that whether the transaction that has been happening whether the income that is offered under the tax it has uh, is at arms length price or not moving further this income also includes expenses also includes cost allocation agreement cost allocation agreement in a simple words means a group entity is doing certain activity on a global level and, uh, the cost is allocated between the group entities based on the uh, participation of those entities moving further to the second concept of international transaction now international transaction is defined as a transaction with an associated entity either or both being non resident now associated entity for just now we can assume it to be similar to related party it is not as it is not same as related party but we will delve into it in the further slides the important thing is either or both being non resident either one or the other entity either one or both the entities in the transaction should be a non resident this non resident also includes rnor which is uh, rnor individual which is resident but not originally resident the second thing is that international transaction should have bearing on profit income losses or assets of such enterprise and there is no minimum transaction threshold in transfer in international transaction now the question arises that what type of transactions would get covered in this scenario it would be all transaction which will have impact on the income of the entity along with that whether capital whether transactions of capital nature will get covered uh, so for example there is a non resident shareholder which has some idle fund and uh such a non such non resident shareholder gives this idle fund to the indian company where is a major shareholder now whether this transaction in the company getting working capital loan uh, will get covered under the purview of international transaction if we read the definition it says that it should have it should have bearing on profit income losses or assets of such enterprise uh to understand this Uh, we can refer to the explanation of section 92a 92b of international transaction which i for of which I, uh, extract of which i have placed in front of you if you look at the definition uh, you look at the explanation you can see tangible property intangible properties even capital financing agreements which include short term borrowing long term borrowing guarantee and purchase sale types of arrangement under the purview of international transaction along with that it also includes any service provided or any business restructuring or business reorganization type of transaction under the purview of international transaction so any of this transaction this is an, another uh, thing to be noted that this is an inclusive list so list can be expanded as and when based on the interpretations and the judicial pronouncements uh, going back but going back to the international transaction transfer pricing definition that the charging the machinery provision of section 92 does not provide any minimum threshold limit for transfer pricing uh, computation now what does this mean that even a transaction of value 1 rupee will get covered under the purview of international transaction 
which means that it has to be reported and moreover than reported it should it should have it should be computed at arms length now moving to the third important thing the next concept is arms length price so arms length price is a price that would be applied in a in an uncontrolled environment for example if a similar transaction is takes place in a environment which is not influenced by the group entities or which is in a common marketplace what would be the ideal price charge in such environment would be arms length price so with that alp intends to undertake the impact of external market and commercial forces that affect the transaction and it ignores the internal forces of the group affecting price in simple words uncontrolled condition the prices that would be charged in an uncontrolled situation will delve over alp further in the upcoming slides as of now to summarize what transfer pricing provisions uh, affect is any income which uh, any income arising from an international transaction which we learned is a transaction between a either of either or both being non resident should be computed at arms length price and this is what transfer pricing intends to check one point that we need to ensure here is that section 92 3923 says that transfer pricing provision shall not apply in situations first when there is reduction in taxable income and second when there is increase in loss now clearly the intent is very clear as we discussed earlier transfer pricing regulations were introduced in india to uh, to with the concept of avoiding profit shifting and preventing the erosion of indian tax base so anything which will lead to reduction in taxable income or profits which are taxed in india would not get directly covered under transfer pricing and which are which would not be required to be assessed at arms length price with that will move to the definition of associated enterprise so international transaction says that associated enterprise and either of one should be non resident so what ideally is this associated enterprise which is defined under section 92a so when we look on section 92a there are two sub clause sub clause 1 sub clause 2 sub clause 1 says that sub clause 1 uh, focuses on three important thing it's a broader and subjective definition and it states that any entity which are which participates directly indirectly in first management or capital or control of any other entity in that case the first entity and the other entity would be regarded as associated enterprise now in this case alpha limited participates directly indirectly in gamma limited and even indirectly in delta limited so alpha gamma delta all three of those would become associated enterprise as per subsection 1292a1 other thing says that when one entity exercises this management capital or control of two entities even which is beta limited and gamma limited even in that case those two entities that is beta and gamma would be deemed as associated and uh, this is what section 92a gives one now section 92a2 is a more criteria based section where there are 13 prescribed conditions on satisfying of which it the transactions would be related as deemed a relations this section 92 1a and 92 12 the 13 clauses that we are going to learn about now are usually are ideally to be looked together whether both these conditions are satisfied or not in order to Uh, in order to determine associated enterprise relations important to note that associated enterprise relations the definition given is different from related party definition given under as 18 or india's 24 as the case may be and even in the income tax act that is section 40a 2b so 13 clauses of associated enterprise will try to cover the major clauses which usually which are commonly seen. so first is substantial voting power wherein any entity holds 26% or more voting share in the other entity directly or indirectly in our case a and b are associated enterprise because 
51 percent stake, more than 26 percent. B and C are associated enterprise before because more than 26 percent stake, and even A and C becomes associated enterprise because effectively the stake is more than 26 percent. The second condition is where associated enterprise. Uh, where a single entity holds more than 26% in both the entities. Now, relationship between Mr. A and company B would get covered into the first clause of 26%. Similar relationship between entity A, Mr. A and company B would get covered under 26%. But company B and company C would, it would be regarded as associated enterprise under this subsection as they are, as the control, as single uh, as person Mr. A exercises more than 26% control in both the entities. 26% voting power. These are the words of the act as brought in that. The third condition would be advancing loan. Wherever a company advances more than 51% of the loan to other entity of book value of the entity, then such entities would be regarded as arms, uh, would be regarded as associated enterprise. Then there, are, there is a clause for borrowings where borrowings exceed 10% of the total, uh, where guarantee exceeds 10% of the total borrowing. Even in that case, entities are, are deemed to be associated entities. Then, then there is a clause of appointment of majority directors, which is more than half of the directors of board of directors or more than one executive director in the company. In that cases, uh, the parties are deemed to be associated entities. Then going ahead the three the first three clauses are based on dependency wherein uh, where an entity is dependent on other entity maybe for ip that they require for manufacturing purposes or the 90 percent of raw materials that they are using in production or the sales activities that they are carrying out are on direction of the uh, direction of the uh, another company in that cases the entities, the relationship would be deemed to be associated enterprise. So control, uh, hmm. and the next clause is control by a common individual. Now, for example, if Mr. A controls company B and wife of Mr. A controls company B, in that case, company A and company B would be deemed to be an associated entity. Now, if Mr. A would directly, directly Whole company B, even in that case, it, both the situations would be uh, regarded to company A and company B would be regarded to be associated enterprise. Uh, the important thing is the definition of the word control. The section does not explicitly define the word control. It can be interpreted as a power to make strategic decisions and various several judicial pronouncements can be relied upon. Further, the definition of word relative. Now, relative is not as broad as what is covered under uh, sub, under the IFOS clause 56 to 10. So for relative definition, we'll go back to subsection 2, wherein relative is defined as individual means a husband, wife, brother, or sister, or any other lineal descendant or lineal descend, ascendant or descendant of that individual. It's a narrow term and it should be clearly kept in mind when you are looking for an associated enterprise relationship. Further, there are if, the, if there is a control by HUF, even that would be regarded as uh, associated enterprise. Interest in firm would be regarded as associated enterprise, or even mutual interest relationship. So the clause thirteen, there there has been an open clause by the department wherein they wherein as they, and when as and when they feel right, appropriate, they can prescribe any specific relations to get covered under the definition of associated enterprise. So as of now, we covered subsection one of 92A, which specifies on three important things, three important things, which is management, control, and capital. And then we went on to subsection two, which provides 13 different situations wherein transaction can be deemed to be a deemed to be associated enterprise. With this background, what we'll do, we'll take up an example. Uh, I understand the chat box is not uh, active, so I'll just give, just explain the example. So there is a jockey INC and there is a page industry. Jockey INC being non-resident, page industry being resident. Both the entities are unrelated. Uh, jockey INC in export in 
page industry imports uh, raw materials worth 189 crores from jockey ifc wherein the total consumption of raw material is 200 crores so now the question comes is whether jockey inc and page industry would be regarded as deemed associate enterprise under the subsections that we discussed earlier i guess chat box has been open so i'll you can respond by saying yes or no whether you think that entities uh, can be regarded as associate enterprise or not we have got yes and i'll request uh, people to be a bit participative because if I go on, then it would become a very boring session for even you guys. So as we, so yeah, so the question is whether Jockey, INC and Page Industry will become associated, deemed associated enterprise from the sections that we just discussed about. So, so majority we have got the answer as yes, but it is very important to note that both the section, section 92A1 and section 92A2 needs to be satisfied simultaneously to ensure that there is a A relationship between two entities. Correctly pointed out by most of the participants that 90% of the raw material, 90% or more of the raw material has been sourced by Jockey INC, uh, has been sourced from Jockey INC. However, in absence of uh, in absence of proving that there has been no influence in management, capital, or control of page industry by Jockey INC, both the entities can still be regarded as still uh, can still be regarded as non-associated enterprise. And, and this comes from the guidance note and the memorandum when memorandum of the memorandum of the Finance Act when Section 92. A2 was introduced. Now, there is a concept of deemed international transaction. So, what we learned just now, what is an international transaction? A transaction between two associated enterprises, which comes from section 92A that we just discussed. And either or one, either both or one should be a non decision. But there are certain situations wherein, even if there is not an associated enterprise relationship, both the entities would be deemed to be. Uh, so, uh, the transaction between two entities would be deemed to be international transaction under the purview of transfer price. Now, when does this situation happen? First, there are two situations. First is there should be a prior agreement of such third party with the SSC and there or the terms of such transaction are determined by the associated entity and such other person. We'll go through example for a clear understanding of this topic. So, uh, on the on my left side, there is a scenario where in parent companies outside India, there is an Indian subsidiary in India. There is no transaction between parent company or Indian company, but there is another third related party outside India. And this third related party transacts with Indian subsidiary. Now, in this scenario, the transaction that happens between unrelated third party and Indian subsidiary is influenced and influenced basis a prior agreement that parent company had with unrelated party. In that very scenario, deemed international transaction, uh, the, the transaction that takes place between unrelated third party and Indian subsidiary also get covered under deemed international transaction. Now, this is a global purview, wherein even associated, wherein the third, even third, unrelated third party was outside India. But if such unrelated third parties in India, then the condition of that either or both should be non-resident does not satisfy. However, even in that case, such a domestic transaction on our right side would get covered under the definition, under the situations covered by deemed international transaction. That is, if transaction that takes place between an unrelated third party and company A is influenced by company B, or is basis the agreement that company B in outside India had with unrelated party in India, that transaction would also get covered under the definition of deemed international transaction, which would be subject to arms length price criteria. With that being clear, we'll move towards the next concept of specified domestic transaction. Now, specified domestic, as we discussed, that transfer pricing is generally called an international perspective. 
However, it was observed that tax base or tax erosion can also happen when entities are located in the same jurisdiction, that is India. Now, I now this situation only happen where entities have certain kind of deductions or certain profiting deductions or beneficial taxation that uh, taxation regime that they offer. So there are three important conditions for SDT to apply. It should not be an international transaction, of course. The second would be uh, it should get covered under two to four clause of section 92 BA, which says of domestic transaction. Now, this clause is ideally cover deductions under ATA, profit link deductions, ATIA types of deductions, and even 115 BAB, that is 15% uh, taxation regime for manufacturing entities and corporate entity, uh, cooperative societies. And the third important condition is that aggregate transaction should not cross INR 20, uh, aggregate transaction should cross INR 20 crores. When these three conditions are when these three conditions are satisfied, only in that case SDT becomes applicable. And once the SDT becomes applicable, again as as we do in international transaction, arms length price, which is similar to market price, has to be checked whether the transaction is on arms length basis or not. Uh, moving forward, till now what we covered was the important concepts of transfer pricing, which were very important to. Now begin with now begin with how we are going to go about the transfer pricing audit that we carry on every year. So transfer pricing audit is an extensive process, and it is a step by step process wherein you ascertain and do you review that the transaction entered are at arm's length price or not, and ensure that there is no profit shifting outside in. So what? What I have presented here is the step-by-step -step process of how we are going to go about a transfer pricing audit. As if, if you are going to perform transfer pricing audit tomorrow, you have all clear in mind how you can go about it. Uh, and in detailed discussion, what are the important things that you should be aware of? So the first important step would be identification of associated enterprise according to the definitions, the discussions that we did today, and whether the transaction, whether there are any international transaction between these associated enterprise. Once we have Covered. So, what I will do, I will cover it step by step in the upcoming slides. Identification of any and international transaction. So, the first thing that comes to our mind when we talk about associated enterprise is related party. Is related party because both are similar terms. So, what we will do, we will ask for audited financial statements because uh, there is a reporting, uh, reporting compliance reporting requirement under ASED. And in India is 24 to report the transactions that has taken place with related parties. Now, even though both the definitions are different, uh, the audited financial and this reporting schedule forms as a standpoint, a basis for you to analyze what possible relations can be uh, pointed out and what possible transactions that you have to be aware of. The second important thing would be previous year tax audit and transfer pricing reporting. To be obtained because then the similar nature of transactions can be identified. The next is MNC group structure or ownership structure. So usually the company maintains the group structure, and through the group structure, you can easily identify what the group entities are. Now, once these group entities are identified, you will then go on checking whether any of these group entities fall under the A relationship or not. Once you have ascertained that, what you will do is you will call for the ledgers of this A company to identify whether any international transaction has been entered or not. And with that, you will have a list of transactions verified uh, on your hand to identify what are the transactions that you have to purview on the transfer pricing audit. Again, no materiality concept in reporting of transaction. This is very, very important because transfer pricing does not provide the threshold that transactions be beyond this, this level are not to be reported. Instead, transfer pricing focuses on covering all the transactions, whether or not a value is charged, a value charge is nominal, or a value charge is substantial. Further, we need to exercise due caution to identify deemed international transaction because this type of transaction could not be uh, clearly visible and even specify domestic transaction because what we have in our mind is that transfer pricing is all about international transaction and so on. And again, transaction with without any explicit consideration or non-monetary transaction needs to be specifically evaluated, like guaranteed transaction or industry loan given between entities or not. 
with that, once we have identified our international transactions, the next important becomes functional analysis, which is functions asset risk par analysis. Now, what is par analysis? Par analysis is basically analyzing the significant economic activities that are performed in a transaction. It's a transaction specific approach where you analyze what are the functions performed by the entity in that by both the entities that is related uh, by that is Indian associated enterprise and foreign associated enterprise in a transaction. Now, why this is important? Because to allocate what activities or what functions and risk, functions, asset and risk are borne by individual and individual enterprise, because this characterization becomes a benchmarking, uh, becomes a standpoint to determine what type of profit the entities are supposed to earn. The price, the transfer price charge between both the entities should always reflect what are the functions performed, risk assumed and asset put to use. So to understand power analysis more in a better way, uh, we will move toward the next example, which is a comparison between a full-fledged manufacturer and contract manufacturer. Now, basis the different uh, basis the different functions carried out by both the manufacturers, different risks assumed by both the manufacturers, the compensation changes. Now, how, how does that happen? A full fat manufacturer will usually produce for their own. A contract manufacturer will produce for the principal who has contracted such contract money. To, to, go, uh, to, to start with what is a contract manufacturer, a contract manufacturer would be someone who, who has a manufacturing facility but who produces for a principal who owns the technology. So if Apple Limited has owns the iPhone technology, it will source the technology to Foxon. He'll, he'll ask Foxon to produce Apple phones on behalf of Apple. And then Apple will deal with the sales and distribution functions on their own. With that being clear, intellectual property right, a full-fledged manufacturer owns that IP. A contract manufacturer in that case does not own the IP. The IP is owned by the principal. Materials, usually both the entities source their own materials. However, that might be requirement of certain type of materials for contract manufacturer to be to be only used because they are producing it for their principal. Production schedule, again, a full-fledged manufacturer will decide for themselves. But for a contract manufacturer, it is done by the principal because he, as and when they give order, schedule the production. Selling and distributor function. Now, this is the responsibility of manufacturer. Uh, in a, in the full fledged manufacturer, it's a responsible of themselves. For a contract manufacturer, it, their duty ends wherein the manufacturing facility is completed and goods are shipped to the client, the principal. Knowing this, as more functions are more functions are or performed by full fledged manufacturer, it is very important to compensate full fledged manufacturer accordingly to that uh, accordingly uh, for that functions. And at the same time, the risk risk assumed by full fledged manufacturer would be ideally high. For example, the profits that a contract, a full-fledged manufacturing will earn will be based on the market demand and market forces. Whereas contract manufacturer will go on demanding a fixed compensation for the activities that they're carrying out, they, uh, the cost plus a certain markup that he expects. And because of the changes in the risk, the functions employed, I'll always, I'm not even, you in the case would feel that a, full-fledged manufacturer should always earn higher returns because the risk assumed is more, the responsibility performed is more. And this becomes very important in power analysis, uh, the power or the functional analysis become very important because characterization of an entity would become a primary step based on which, what, come, what type of transfer price to be charged becomes relevant. Uh, with that, we'll move to the next slide which is most appropriate method. Now, what we have done till here, identify the transaction, characterize the environment, characterize the transaction based on power analysis. Now we have to, now we have to uh, look on what is the most appropriate method for benchmark. ALP. Now, how does that move on? Is, uh, there are six prescribed methods by the department itself what they say uh, in by which they should benchmark a transaction. Three being traditional methods, which are comparable uncontrolled price method, resale price method, and cost plus method. Now I'll go step by step for a clear understanding. 
what is a comparable uncontrolled price method or cup that we call. So then a cup is a direct to direct and accurate comparison of what you are charging. For example, if I am a I am an Indian party and there is an I am an Indian party and there is a non-related party to which I am selling some goods at 100 rupees. So the best comparison to this transaction would be me selling same goods to an unrelated party. If I am selling the same goods to unrelated party at 100 rupees, I can very well say that I am not making any difference between the price that I am selling to an unrelated party or price I am selling to my associated entity. And hence, my transaction is at arm's length price. Now, this example is an example of an internal cup. External cup could be same, but in the very sense, uh, it would be together in an all in an entire uncontrolled condition, wherein a third party sells to an unrelated party at a price of hundred. If I can establish that, I can use that comparable uncontrolled price method, saying both the entities are selling at the same prices with same functions. So external cup is usually avoided because there, there is lack of public domain data in regards to that. Further, when we are applying the cup method, the important things, the terms of arrangement are to be very specifically taken care of because quality, contractual terms, even credit period, inco terms, the markets that the goods are going to go into or warranty period, installation services. Now, these factors may not be that significant, but it will change the prices charge in the transaction. So given that this all contractual terms that we discussed now are in, uh, are in same way, we can say that cup method, the best example of cup would be the one that I discussed at the first, that a box of mango being supplied by an Indian farmer, related one and unrelated one. Now, if if we are supplying an Alfonso mango and a Dusa Devgiri mango, in that case, the prices have to be different because these are two different commodities and there is no apple to apple comparison in both the commodities. It's the most preferred method because it gives a direct and accurate comparison. Go ahead and compare it, and there is no uh, benchmarking uh, benchmarking process in that. The second is resale price method. Now, this method is usually used by distributors on selling to the third party. As in, if I am I, I am getting some goods from a related party and I am selling it to the market, I use this method. And how I check is I'll check what resale gross margin I'm earning on sale to my associated enterprise and what resale gross margin I'm, I'm earning on sale to an unrelated enterprise. If that margin is almost the same range, I can assume to take this method. Now, now this can happen again in two ways. This was the internal comparison. The external comparison would be a third unrelated uh, uh, un party charging, uh, comparing unrelated parties' gross margin to a sale to an unrelated party. This method is usually used by distributors. The, sec the third method would be cost plus method. Now, cost plus method is generally used by manufacturing and service providers because what this method does is this method includes all the operating profits of the operating cost of the entity. Check how much markup or how much margin the entity is earning over this operating cost and compares it with the entities having similar background or similar nature. So a cost plus method becomes a very effective way because it ensures that the entire cost incurred in providing a service or manufacturing a product has been well covered. And it is frequently used by manufacturer and service providers. The next method, next two methods are transactional methods. Generally, it is a this is a set view that traditional methods should be applied first and transactional methods to be other. But the rules or the act does the rules of the act does not specifically provide anything. They focus on the concept of most appropriate method, wherein which whatever method gives you the correct. Uh, arms length price, which gets to the correct arms length price, should always be kept as a benchmark for selecting the method. Now, what these two methods are about? First is profit split method. Now, profit split method arises in a case where it is very, very difficult to find a comparator. 
what happens is if suppose there is an intangible being produced or technology being produced several different entities are involved in different jurisdiction uh, and and they have their respective contribution to that intangible now what happens is that intangible might not have a hard and apple to apple comparison so how do you value this how do you value the transaction how do you ensure the transfer price between the entities that are correct or not so what you usually do is you compensate the entities based on the market returns and then residual profit based on the contribution and efforts of the entities the functions that they are carried out so what happens is it's a overall and a tedious job to analyze the entire transaction to analyze what all the functions and what all responsibilities have been uh, what all contributions have been performed by the respective entities and to compensate them likewise based on the contribution and efforts the fifth method is transactional net margin method now this method assesses assess the entity on the operate net operating of operating margins of the entity and it is most frequently used because usually it's very difficult to find a like to like comparable uh, of your company or if your transaction in that very case what you go on doing is you compare the uh, you compare the net profit earned by your entity and net profit earned by similar entities in your industry doing your type of activity and compare whether both transactions are at same price or not and this is what transactional net margin method is though it is less preferred but it is most frequently used due to lack of comparable uh and then there is a residuary method that is any other method uh, though i say it is a residuary method it can be very well used as most appropriate method given that about five and about five methods fail to prove fail to get you to a arms length price which is uh correct in the market sense so where this five specific transactions fail you will can go for any other method so for issue of shares or purchase of machinery you can rely upon a valuation report made by a registered valuer so that you have a even that can be used as a benchmarking tool uh in all these cases is important it's a accepted audit rule that larger the sample size it would give you more accurate data with that the next thing will go about that once we have identified what the most appropriate method suited to the transaction is will will go on with the next steps that would be i'll i'll prepare now few of the points are intending to the most appropriate method for understanding of the most appropriate method and understanding of the par analysis so how you'll go about understanding the par you'll prepare a very detailed question a for par now what you will do in a question a is you will ask questions like how the transaction is been carried out what are the terms involved in the transaction the terms that i discussed with you the quality terms the the inco terms uh, import export terms credit period and ex, ex, external all details these details becomes very important as as we previously discussed how important par analysis is uh and importantly when we do audit our major connection point is with the finance team in start audit or a tax audit we are in touch of finance team to financially check that figures are proper or not but in transfer pricing along with the figures to for figures to be correct it is very important to understand what actually the business scheme is so there is frequent interaction with the business team in terms of understanding the transaction and determining which would be the most suitable way to justify that transaction now how we can you can do that is to the document that has written down on the right side of the ppt that is you can collect agreements and invoices ask for quotations third party quotations that you have that you have obtained even that can be obtained you can obtain for op, ask for ledgers communication negotiations relevant to the transactions third party supporting now third party supporting becomes very important in case of reimbursement type of invoices like for entity has charged you for insurance that insurance that they have avail for you in outside india and they are charging the cost to cost thing so how you will check you will ask for the exact invoice that insurance company had charged to foreign entity and you will check whether the the charge made by insurance company to foreign company and charge made by the foreign company to me are same or not then i'll ask for group transfer pricing policy usually mncs enter into this such transfer pricing enter into such transfer pricing policies where they fix the market So you'll ask for that. You will understand what is the basis of that transfer pricing policy and how you can incorporate that in your 
conservising benchmarking exercise. Then you will ask for any other benchmarking exercise has been entered before entering the transaction or not, and independent valuation certificate as I discussed with you. Then you will first, as I tell, as I shared with you, that top is top that is comparable unit price is the most accurate, most direct, and most accurate comparable. So you'll try looking whether there is cup or not. Now, why this is important is if suppose you if suppose you go with any other method that is uh, CPM or TNMM, you compare operating profits or net profit, even after uh, having a uh, reliable comparable data in cup. In that very case, or in case of in that very case, an assessing officer or transfer pricing officer can come up to you and ask, why have you not assessed through cup when it was readily available? So it is very important to have it have this thing in mind whenever you select any method as an appropriate method and proper documentation has to be maintained with regards to why the why the above five methods or why the above four methods have been rejected or not been relied to and why the by the method that you have selected is the most appropriate method and this has to be very well documented along with facts and findings so once uh, so i'll obtain the valuation reports and there is a concept of safe harbor rules which we will cover in the upcoming slides and and we'll discuss can reference to even safe harbor rules can be made in that case the next slide would be benchmarking process now what I have done till yet, I have decided what method I have to use and how I'm about to go about it. So the next step would be benchmarking the transaction. So next step would be benchmarking the transaction. Out of the universe of company, I'll have to select. So what you will say, what a client will say, he, I am engaged in the business of chemical. I know what my competitors are and I'll give you the data. You check their margin and you compare and tell me that whether I am at arm's length price or not. However, this approach cannot be utilized because this is a biased approach. What the, what the client will do, client will select specifically those comparable companies, those competitors whose margin are relatively lesser than what he is earning. In that very case, a like-to-like comparable being made on an actual basis will become very difficult. So the rule specifically says that the line should be always made on published as well as or published and authentic data source. So while doing conservising, there are several company data bases like Proves, Capital Line, ACP, which have a pool of companies which they have already segregated out based on their uh, industries they operate into and filters. So what you can do, you can go on any of uh, one of these websites. So we can go ahead taking example of Proves. So Proves as a database has 50,000 companies in that, uh, in them, with them. So out of this 50,000 company, to get to your comparable companies, what you will first do, you will select the industry that a company is operating into. Suppose chemical, so I'll type chemicals. Then I'll again, I'll get a narrow down companies. I'll again narrow down the companies based on what specific chemicals that I'm dealing into. What is my business model? For example, if I am a trader, I'll look for the companies who are traders to compare the margin. So I'll remove companies who are even engaged in manufacturing activities. Then I'll check what is my turnover. If I'm earning 20, I'm on, on average earning 50 to 100 crores. I'll try to select companies that are in the same price, uh, same turnover band and not very small companies or very huge companies having 1000 crores or such turnovers. With that, with such types of filter, I'll keep down, keep narrowing down the companies to reach a specific set of companies which, uh, which might be comparable to me. Now, out of these companies, then the next step becomes qualitative filters, which is that you will qualitatively analyze whether the company is comparable. Or not. Now, how will you do that? Is you will go to company's website, you will go, you will check for company's annual report, and you will check whether the activities that have been described on the website or given in the annual report matches with the activities that you are performing. And once that extensive quality filters or quality search has been done, will finally arise to a set of companies or a companies or, or set of companies which are comparable to your industry, your, your activities and your transaction. Okay. And then your analysis would 
then move on based on this companies. Once I've identified this company, the next step would be financial analysis of those companies. So I'll check what I'm earning on my transaction. I'll check what these companies are earning on that transaction. Okay. And then I'll make a comparison whether what I am earning is matching with what the companies, comparable companies are earning. Three important points that we need to keep in mind when we are doing a transfer pricing, this benchmarking process. First is selection of tested party. Now, tester party is a concept wherein, uh, just a second. Tester party is a concept wherein, uh, is, a, is a concept wherein entity from whose perspective the transfer pricing benchmarking is going to be undertaken. For example, if I am an associated, I am an Indian company and I have a foreign entity outside India, I am performing huge manufacturing functions. Uh, I am performing manufacturing functions. I have intangibles and my foreign entity outside India just performs distributor and distribution and sales function. So in that case, if I can find compare, uh, in that case, I can say that I am a complex entity having different types of function and finding a comparable for me would become difficult. So what I'll do is if I have comparables for my foreign entity, so I'll select my foreign entity as my tested party and do the entire transferizing search basis my foreign entity being my tested party. Now, how will that happen is if I have a adequate and sufficient data source for the transaction entered by the foreign entity with other entities or in general, uh, the transaction entered out of outside India, I'll, I can, I can very well go about taking this, uh, selecting my foreign associate as tested party. So the selection criteria is that generally the least complex entity along with availability of data should be always, uh, should be always be uh, selected as a tested party. The second concept is range concept. So what if you have got six companies or seven companies in that case, how will you determine what is the arms length price? So what the department says that beyond for six, for five companies or less than six companies, you can use arithmetic mean of the comparable companies that you have got of the margin of the comparable companies that you have got and for six or more companies, you can use a range concept and arms length price can be ranged between 35th and 65th percent, 65th percentage. So what is this that if suppose you have 10 companies, you will arrange the margins earned by these 10 companies in ascending order. Then you'll find what is the 35th position. What is the 65th position it, that will usually mean a, a decimal, uh, not the whole number. So you'll go to the next whole number and then you'll find the range. And if your transaction that you have carried out the margin, your margin is within that range. You can very well say that the transaction is at arm's length price or not. And then there's a concept of tolerance band. The tolerance band concept is not as frequently used, but it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a provide, it's a given thing under the rules, which states that if Margin, if the margins, if the international transaction entered by you and the arms net arms length interaction price has a difference of a small variance, then you can adjust your international transaction by 1% or 3%, whatever the case may be. 1% is usually for whole wholesale trading transaction and 3% is for other transactions. Tolerance band is slightly for uh, tolerance band is, band is only for slight acceptable deviations of international transaction from ALP value that you complete. Now, at this point, we have completed the entire benchmarking process as in how we can practically benchmark a transaction. Before moving forward to the accountant report, that is form 3CB, uh, if anyone has any questions, we can take that. So we'll move towards the next slide, next important topic that is the topic transferizing audit. So we have understand what, how audit, audit takes place in a practical scenario. Now, how this transactions are reported. It is reported to our accountant's report, which is form 3CEB. What I have placed in front of you is the bare extract of the form 3CEB and relevant things highlighted so that even you can glance through the form. If you look at the first clause, it says that there 
this form 3c b is applicable to every person who has entered into an international transaction or a specified domestic transaction so even if not so the the no threshold limit even if you have entered into a small transaction which is international or sdt uh, form 3c b requirement would be applicable to you the second is that when accountant is doing this form 3c b he has to examine the proper doc information and documentations that is in prescribed in the rules so these documents have to be maintained by the cc and to be examined by the accountant that is a c and third is very important which is true and correct reporting so unlike the audit start audit that we do where we comment on the true and fairness of the uh, financial statements in transfer pricing what we focus majorly is on correctness correctness means accuracy and this is a higher responsibility which this casts a higher responsibility on the assessee as well as on the chartered accountant doing this form 3c so the reporting of international transaction through form 3c b is done <coughs> every year by 31st october and this form 3c b is to be mandatory filed through the income tax portal of the assessee so the next thing the next thing that we are going to look is what is the management's responsibility pertaining to this form 3c b and what is ca's responsibility pertaining to form 3c b so as a management management is responsible for identifying all the international transaction and sdt management is further responsible for computing what the arms length price is the onus is on the management to maintain all the prescribed documentation and records and then the management has to fill on all the annexures to form 3c b and furnish the same along with the mrl to the accountant and once this has been done the accountant's responsibility starts into where an accountant will examine whether the information furnished by the management is as as stated by the rules or not it will conduct a detailed examination to check whether everything has been covered or not it will comment on truth and correctness on the details furnished in form 3c b and this all the accountant does through the transfer pricing audit process that we just discussed earlier now accountant has been defined under section 288 wherein there are prescribed conditions so accountant is a ca and usually for understanding we can say that uh as mentioned in the section if accountant is not not uh, eligible for appointment as an auditor it is also not eligible as an appointment for a tp auditor with that we'll move through annexures of form 3c so here i have summarized for you what are the annexures for form 3c b it's usually divided into three important clause three important parts part a general information it covers the information about assessee the business activity that is been carried out by the assessee and aggregate amount of value of the transactions entered the international transactions it specifies list of aids with whom you have entered into transaction then you have to specifically write here as per which clause you constitute a now this reinforces again that one of the conditions from 13th clauses has to be satisfied for an a relationship along with that business of the e as well as the new requirement is furnishing 10 of the tns tax identification number of the associated enterprise in the respective jurisdiction in case they are pan pan needs to be furnished too now then a clause by clause reporting starts wherein they cover all sorts of transactions the transaction entered into nature of transaction and i'll show show the ex, ex, uh, extract of the form 3c in the further slide and similarly the case with specified domestic transaction you have to you have to give the list of a business and their pans so this is clause 11a that i have extracted from form 3c b as prescribed in rules so this clause is specifically for purchase and sales of raw material so what does this include uh you have to give name and address of the a description of the transaction even you have to give quantity purchased or sold now this is a important thing as you have to even check whether the quantity has been correctly captured or not because the transaction cannot be solely benchmarked unless you know you are aware about what the quantity is into picture or not then you have to write what is the total amount as per books you are all you are you also need to write what is the arms length price computed by the assessee 
again enforcing that alp should be completed by sec and then method used by the sec for determining al and this is a extract of reporting uh, of the tabular format of how the same 11 a is reported name and id number has been blanked out uh, you write whether it's a purchase of consumables purchase of raw material even you have to specify on that you cannot leave that just writing a blanket statement ki this this has been reported you have to even write unit of measurement so if entity has a multiple unit of measurement so you can collectively write key this this units of measurement have been reported you have to write amounts as per book arms length price method use and type of transaction then the important is there is a column of observation and remarks wherein you can write any caveats or a certain information which is not captured in form 3cb clauses you can highlight there or bring out some caveats so this becomes a very important para as for a transferizing auditor as a chartered accountant to ensure that full reporting has been done or not then this is another example on similar lines this is regarding services again the similar clauses like name description of services amount alp method use and this is another extract from our another client which was engaged in software development services and so on so so we understood what how form 3c did three parts of form 3c b and what all is to be reported so if you are supposed to file form 3c b tomorrow what would be an adequate and necessary office procedures or uh, steps that you will do in filing form 3c b the first would be appointment letter a client should sign client should specifically send you an appointment letter and the appointment letter should be signed by a person who is authorized to file income tax returns in that case then you have to add ca and assign from 3cb on assessee's income tax portal once that is done you have to obtain mrl stating these are all the transaction and these are all the information brought in by the management uh, brought into in the highlight of the auditor by the management then usually it's a practice to sign form file form tcb physically to have for records since it is a certification made it, a union needs to be mandatorily generated then a uh, form 3cb is supposed to be filed on chartered accountants income tax portal then it is to be further accepted from assessor's income tax portal and the next important step would be to update union on income tax in on cas Chartered accountants income tax portal because on uh, failure of doing so would held form 3CEP filed as null and void and as if no reporting has been done. The next would be transfer pricing documentation. Understanding form 3CEP, there was a clause and that prescribed documentation has been maintained by SSC on. So, what type of documentation requirement SSC has when he enters into industrial transaction? has been given by income tax rules and there are three specific types of information uh, we can categorize into three heads the first is enterprise wise group enterprise wise and group wise information the other is transaction specific information and the third is computation related information so enterprise wise and group information would generally include what the enterprise is uh, what is the business of the enterprise what is the group engaged into what are the international transactions that have been entered into what are the FAR and what are the relevant, uh, what the analysis of the industry that the SSC is into. The transaction by transaction specific uh, information would be uh, the transactions that the SSC have entered into, international transactions and SDT. Now, in that, what you will do is you will write about the transaction, you will specify about the FAR analysis that you did. did to benchmark the transaction, to characterize the transaction. Once this characterization is done, then we'll write about how we have selected the most appropriate method. Now, which methods have been selected, why the methods have been rejected, and this all has to be very in detail and in with appropriate documentation has to be maintained for this. Once all these analysis have been done, we will move to the third, which is computation related information. Now what computation related information would would cover is what is the uh, margins earned by your company what is the margins earned by the uh, no so 
what is the margins earned by your company then how you have selected your comparable companies how that benchmarking process that we earlier discussed then how you have calculated the margins of the selected companies selected comparable companies all the concept of range and everything would be all the concepts all the requirements all the concepts of the range and other things would be eventually covered in that along with that uh, now this summarizes the entire documentation documentation related requirements uh, the documentation related requirement is the responsibility of the management to be to maintain everything in order and to furnish the same to the auditor uh, to the consulting auditor for review and comment now there has been a relaxation prescribed for aggregate transaction value uh, where this where uh, documentation is not to be maintained in the prescribed format that we just discussed and this is where the transaction value does not exceed inr 1 crore but however in case of notice the assessee needs to furnish all the required documents to substantiate that transaction has been made at arms length price or not now what happens is that the the transfer pricing officer can send you a notice and can send you to and ask you to send all the necessary documents that you have used to uh, substantiate uh, for transfer pricing benchmarking that is alp within 10 days this is a recent amendment so in case you don't have any documentation maintained uh, it would become a a task for you to calculate such an extensive process and submit it to the transfer pricing officer now this requirement is also applicable to applicable in case where you have exemption or relaxation in maintaining transfer pricing document that is inr 1 crore threshold even in that case you need to furnish to the ao within 10 days that you have that how you have substantiated that the transaction has happened at alp or not so the express the relaxation is on maintaining the maintaining documents in a prescribed way but not on the part that you have determined alp or not uh, how you have determined alp so uh, further this prescribed documentation has to be maintained by the assc till 8 from uh, for 8 years from the end of the relevant assessment year that which is approximately 9 years from the when transaction has taken place so what we just talked about was the local file reporting or uh, local file reporting now transfer pricing documentation happens is a three layered documentation a local file that we just discussed then there is a master file and then there is a country by country reporting so master file reporting uh, applies where certain threshold certain thresholds are met and whenever an entity is a part of a constituent group and there is a reporting requirement so the master file can be divided into two reporting requirements there is part a and there is part b part a is applicable to all the entity who are part of an international group so it's a intimation type of thing that i am part of this group this is my group this is my parent company and this is the address and relevant details of my parent company and part b the detailed description of the transaction that you have entered into and transaction you have entered into on a global level and when certain thresholds are met according to the act so master file as we are discussing the documentation is primarily responsibility of the management so there is no uh, attestation requirement for this master file or c by c r reporting as it is to be uh, maintained and furnished by the taxpayer and then there is a country by country reporting it's a very extensive reporting where a uh, where a company has a global presence all over the country and this is applicable only when turnover of the entire group crosses a threshold of 6400 crores so the next i have kept in front of you is the snapshot of transfer pricing study report of how we go about we have just discussed of discussed all this uh, previously i'll quickly go through it executive summary information and background uh well it the executive summary is entire what study report is that you have done then corporate background you write about your group about the company what is the ownership structure what are the transactions then you even write about the industry what transfer pricing study the industry analysis also become important that how industry is how industry operates how what a global industry is what indian industry is sorry 
how the products are placed in the markets and what are the future trends of the industry. Then you write about the applicability of TP regulations. You write about what are the A relationships and what are the international and institutional transactions that you have entered into. Functional analysis is the far analysis and you give a brief description like the table that we furnish, you write what are the functions that we have provided, what are the functions that your SSC has, your associate enterprise has done. And in that way, you go about furnishing all the requirements, uh, all the required documents. Then comes economic analysis, where you choose your tested party, you choose what is the most appropriate method, and then you go on with the benchmarking. You find all the relevant companies, you do the transfer pricing study report, emphasizes on documenting the entire benchmarking process used. So what software you have used, what companies, what are the comparable companies that you have identified, why companies were rejected on based on which filters, based on what criteria, and the entire thing has to be documented very thoroughly. Then margins of the company and margins of the comparable company has to be documented. And if, if in case of any adjustments done, that has to be specified. And in conclusions, drawn has to be summarized that whether transactions are ALP or not. So if you if, if we talk about this, the entire study report goes on from starting from minimum 50 pages to it's just never ending thing like how big your transactions are and how this, how big your entity is. With that, we'll now go to, we have now completed what are the documentation requirements. We'll cover some important aspects of transfer pricing, which, were, which are also to be kept in mind. The, the next is safe harbor rules. Now, what are safe harbor rules? Are uh, provide a pre, safe harbor rules provide a predetermined transferizing margins for certain eligible SEC. Now, this eligible SEC and international eligible international transaction has been has been in detail given in the rules. And I have just provided an extract what type of transactions are covered. It covers ITS type of transaction, KPO, uh, ITS is uh, information technology enabled services, knowledge processing, outsourcing type of knowledge process, outsourcing type of transactions, intra-group loan, any corporate loan, R&D services carried out by Indian entity or some low value added services carried out by Indian entity. So for this transaction, what department has done has prescribed that if, uh, if, if you are earning this, this percent of margin, then you did not go through the entire benchmarking process of finding comparable companies. You can very well rely on the safe harbor margins provided and then go about benchmarking the transactions. So see this, the, so for opting the safe harbor application you, uh, from 3CEF and 3CEFB has to be furnished by 30th November. Now furnishing this application would not uh, provide any relaxation to the SSC for not filing from 3CEF. That is to be mandatorily furnished by SSC post which you can apply for safe harbor, which can, which will get accepted based on the transaction entered into. Now, what is the, what are the advantages of opting safe harbor? You have certainty in transfer pricing. So what happens is at times, if you, you have a process of benchmarking, then the AO or TPO assessing officer, transfer pricing officer will give you the entire thing, which sometimes lead to lengthy litigation, not sometimes I'll say plenty of times lead to lengthy litigations. And then it is a, and safe harbor is a simplified and a defined compliance process. It provides relaxation to the SSC as well as to the officers that the transactions are on arm's length price and no, uh, no things are well, things are not to be very made very complex. However, however, the safe harbor rules, the markups provided by safe harbor margin margin cups are relatively much higher than what industry standards would be. So it becomes difficult for the SSC to opt those safe harbor rules, and hence previously had been written that references to the safe harbor rule can be made. Further, safe harbor rules are notified year on year on yearly basis. So there may lie a uncertainty, uncertainty whether safe harbor rules will be notified next year or not. With that, uh, I present in front of you the reporting compliances chart from 3CB, the discuss as we discussed, <coughs> the unsurprising audit report to be filed by 31st October every year. Master file part A and part B reporting is also to be, is also to be furnished. Part A is to be furnished by every constituent entity as we discussed by 30th November. Part, part B is selectively, is limited to selective entities on 
satisfying or certain threshold limits. CCB is an intimation of master file wherein another entity can report on behalf of all the entities in India. That is another thing that is to be done by 31st October. Then there is C by C R related reporting requirements, which have a uh, prescribed due dates usually as mentioned here. Uh, we will not delve into it much as we need to cover the uh, further things. So penalties. Now we understood the entire transferizing thing. What if as a CA, you should always know the consequences of not following this arms then thing. So you, you understood what the arms then thing is. You understood what the entire transferizing thing. But what if you don't do this? What is the penalty on the assessee as well as on as a started accountant? What is the penalty liable on him? So the important penalty is fail, on failure of reporting any transaction, a 2% of the transaction value is charged as a penalty. Now the important is transaction value, 2% of the transaction value. You might, assessee might earn 10%, 12% or even in certain cases, 5 to 6% in the profit margin. Of, of revenue of the transaction value on a transaction. Uh, so in that in that purview, two percent of the transaction becomes a very hefty penalty on the SSE on non-reporting of a transaction. If suppose there's a hundred crore transaction, state forward two crores is penalty of not reporting the transaction. Further, there is a blanket, uh, there is a flat penalty on non-furnishing of form 3CP, which is RNR rupees one lakh. On SSE, there is a on accountant, there is also a penalty of rupees 10,000 if it is found that the accountant has furnished some incorrect information. I have also specified the other penalty requirement, other penalty in case there is any under reporting or risk reporting found 50 to 200 percent, which is common, uh, which is common for uh, even other things. Now, the other thing is if you not maintain prescribed documentation, again, the penalty is 2 percent of value of the international transaction pertaining to which you have not not furnished not furnished information or maintained the document so maintenance of the documentation also becomes an important part of the entire transfer pricing procedure or transferring audit that uh, that entity undertakes master file and cbycr penalties are also high and these penalties should be adequately taken into consideration whenever you are doing the transfer pricing audit the next concept would be interest deduction. Now, uh, this interest deduction is a similar report, is a reporting under, even in tax audit reportings. So what is this? Section 94, we think capitalization rules is applicable to an Indian company or a PE of a foreign company in India. But now we'll keep Indian company in picture who has borrowed some debt from his non-resident associate enterprise. What happens is whenever uh, so what the rule says is if the interest component on such borrowed debt is more than 30% of EBITDA, then the entire excess amount would be disallowed on the disallowed as a tax deductible expenditure in the hands of the Indian company. So the first question is why is such section into picture? So for a global group, uh, when a company is being set up, debt becomes a preferable structuring arrangement that a company prefers because first of all, it provides you a taxable deduction and uh, uh, because it is important that it provides a taxable deduction. Whereas if it's an equity structure company, then uh, there is no dividend, there is no deduction for the dividend payments made. So the entire profit is already taxed and on, or additionally on the dividend payments and uh, additional tax is charged. So what companies do is company keep their equity base very low keep their debt base very high and try to try to send money outside India in a tax efficient manner, manner through interest payments. And to curb this profit going outside India, uh, these provisions are into picture which restricts uh, interest expenses to 30% of the EBITDA. Now, there is a relaxation also given that this condition will only apply if interest payments exceed INR 1 crore in any financial year and the deduction of this INR 1 crore has been taken into PGPP. So uh, not all entities, but entities with huge interest payment are surely getting covered under the ambit of Section 94B, also called as thin capitalization rules. 
along with borrowed debt. If if a foreign associated enterprise decides to give an implicit or explicit guarantee to a lender, and the lender gives you a certain loan on which you are making interest payment, even that will get covered under this section to avoid any indirect flow of money outside India. The disallowed interest, the interest which is more than 30% disallowed in current year is allowed to be carry forward to next eight financial years. Uh, next eight uh, and set up against the profit of the government. There is an exemption on uh, Indian company or P engage in the banking and insurance sector and part of IFSC. So why this clause is important? Because this clause is also reported in tax audit reportings and one must be very uh, very aware about the reportings in both the, both the scenarios. The next thing is what if transfer pricing has been done, everything is having everything has been done, but your transaction is a not transaction is not at arm's length price. What then? What implications would be there? What the taxpayer has to do in that scenario? So in that cases, the transfer pricing officer would suggest first suggest primary adjustment. So primary adjustment is compulsory. That means the difference between your transaction price and arms then price would be the amount not charged not charged to tax in India. Okay. And so what officer will say that not officer, even the individual by himself, what what he can do is he can offer this additional this difference as to tax in India and do a primary adjustment. Uh add the entire thing to the taxable income of the assessor. Now what happens if the taxable, this primary argument, adjustment, the excess money exceeds INR 1 crore? In that case, is the, there is a requirement to bring this, bring this money back in India within 90 days. Because if the profit would have stayed in India, it would have a multiplier effect in generating additional profit. That is the intent of the uh, officers or the lawmakers. And further, since this is going to be treated as an advance, there would be deemed implications of deemed advance and interest error on the transfer pricing, which has to be again accounted for. And so now this option one, it becomes very difficult for a global group because of several regulatory aspects. So what department does, department or the Income Tax Act, Act gives another option is that what you do, you pay an additional tax of 18% plus success, which is effectively comes to 20.21% on the excess money, and then will not then will not ask you to bring the additional money back to India. So these are the two options that are available on the part of SSE whenever the transaction is not at arm's length price and the amount of this difference exceeds INR 1 crore. With this, uh, the entire coverage of today's session has been done. So if to summarize quickly what we learned, what we delved into today was the basics of transfer pricing. That what are the key provisions that trigger transfer pricing. Then we move on the benchmarking aspects altogether. That how the transaction is to be benchmarked. How, what are the key points that you have to take into consideration. And then on some procedural aspects, documentation that has to be maintained, reporting has to be done by, when and what. And what if there is non-compliance and what if there is ALP defeats. So with that, I'll keep the session for open for discussion and any questions would be addressed. So uh, no, I think we uh, covered most of the uh, you know concepts. Yes, it is very important that uh, we generally when we look at uh, an audit, our mindset is on you know uh, looking at the numbers and you know looking the actual accuracy of the reporting. Well, that is equally important. What is also important is that transfer pricing requires a different skill set. You need to have the hat of a chartered accountant as well as a business person because a lot of things depend upon the commercial arrangement, the commercial realities, and the business. Because when you are dealing with transfer pricing, it is always a gray area. It is neither a yes nor a no. It is always a gray area. And you will always have some other other business rationale about why a particular transaction is being undertaken. 
For example, even if you are doing uh, at a discount, then you are giving to a third party. There could be reasons, you know, there could be reasons that, you know, you got a big quantity of order, example, right? Uh, versus you say you get a 100,000 uh, kg order versus a 10 kg order. You are bound to give a discount to a person who is, uh, you know, uh, buying a larger quantity. So similarly, there could be, you know, a lot of situations where you will, if you dip, uh, uh, you know, if you are diving in detail, you will understand that there will be some of the other commercial rationale, which is important to document, to justify why a particular stand has been undertaken. So, you know, apart from uh, the technical subject expertise, it is also required that you always have a business outlook uh, and look at a transaction in a different way than you look in case of a tax or a standard. I think this, this could be my just, you know, closing remark, uh, apart from the technical we has covered, you know, most of the points. And if there are any questions, you know, welcome. So, uh, how does the introduction works? Will, will go through an example. If suppose there is a, there is a company Apple Limited in India, there is a foreign company Apple INC in India. For setting up this Apple Limited company, Apple INC has provided a loan of suppose 20 crores, uh, a loan of suppose 100 crores to Apple Limited for carrying out its operation. The yearly interest payment on such loan is 10%, assuming 10% interest rate comes to 10 crore rupees. Okay. Now in that case, what does the section says? What does the income tax department says is the interest payment of 10 crores should be, should, will only be allowed if it is up to 30% of EBITDA. So in, uh, so if the EBITDA is, if the EBITDA figure is only 20 crores, 30% of 20 crores, that is 6 crores. So the interest expense up to 6 crores would be only allowed and the remaining balance four crores would be disallowed and would be available to be carried forward up to next financial year. Uh, was this explanation clear? Uh, I think there's one question on the profit split method with an example. Uh, so, you know, generally what happens is a profit split method is uh, a generally a complex method, right? Which is applicable in only certain peculiar type of transaction. Like, you know, example, uh, I'll speak that good an example. If there are multiple trees, which are, say, contributing to a development of an intangible, right? If suppose you know, a, a country, uh, you know, entity in location A is supposed to provide the technology, a uh, uh, country in, you know, entity, uh, entity B, which is a different country, is still providing the R&D for, you know, one portion of the technology, and so and so forth, everyone is contributing in some way or the other for development. Of now, generally what happens is these type of transactions are very unique. You know, because if those are in terms of development of an intangible, which are not very commonly uh, used. So how really you benchmark the transaction? So then comes the profit split method. And as the name suggests, what you really do is you split the profit amongst the entities who generally are, you know, contributing or who have contributed the asset, the risk or perform the function. So the general way how a profit split method applies is, first you determine that in a transaction, what is the routine profits which are available? And those are allocated, you know, to the respective entities. And then what is remaining is the profit, which is otherwise a profit attributable to the intangible. And there you may have to undergo more scientific process about what efforts a particular entity has put up, what is the risk that has been come by, and then try and allocate this profit uh, among those entities. So generally here you will need uh, assistance from some external expert. Who so, see, as a chartered accountant, we are not that equipped or qualified really to really allocate a profit to an intangible, right? So you will need a subject matter expert who will be able to then and allocate about how that intangible is valued, how what what functions are relevant, and then you know decide you know okay if you have earned a say you know fifty percent margin, uh, how those fifty percent is allocated between the two. Hope, hope this is clear.